Geopolitics and Empire is joined by cartoonist Jeremy Nell, who hails from Cape Town, South Africa. He's the host of the fantastic Germ Warfare podcast, which I often listen to. Thanks for joining the podcast, uh, Jeremy. How is life in South Africa? Well, uh, it's nighttime here at the moment, but um, where we now? We're going into summer. So I'm happy to say that, uh, that global warming is starting again. Uh, we've, we, we're now exiting global cooling. Well, that, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's good news then. <laughs> and again, uh, public service announcement before I continue the conversation. Let me just remind listeners to subscribe to the Geopolitics and Empire email list. Telegram, Twitter, get on all other platforms because I'm sure I'll be deplatformed uh, eventually. There's geopoliticsandempire.com, Odyssey, BitChute, Brighton, MeWe, Gab, Minds, and Float. Uh, I'm doing the podcast full time, so it would be amazing to get regular support and donations. Thanks to the folks who sent in for August and September. I was able to afford meat and not just survive on tortillas and frijoles. Um, and uh, by the way, do, do, can I call you Germ or Jeremy? Which do you prefer? I don't mind. Um, I my uh my work a work handle has always been germ for what 16 years but my name is jeremy so i go by either as long as you don't say my full name because only my wife does that when she's angry okay all right we'll, we'll stick to germ i'll switch it up so uh <laughs> i thought this week i would take a kind of a mental break because for the last few weeks i've had to actually read um academic texts and books having interviewed professors uh, and the head of the european council on foreign relations so I thought I'd shoot the breeze with some comrades in arms. Yesterday, mm. I, spoke, I spoke with uh, Michael Parker of The Antidote Show. Uh, and so I thought, why not reach out to, to Germ? Uh, I'm finding that listeners tend to prefer non-establishment people like Michael and Germ who speak off the cuff and tell it like it is, like we all know uh, it is. So yes. maybe I'll start uh, by asking you, Germ, about your foray and transition into podcasting. Uh, I first started doing it as a classroom experiment, but also because generally I had no one intelligent to talk to. And so over time, I decided to make Geopolitics and Empire a proper podcast. And now I'm attempting to transition it from a hobby to a paying job. Not quite there yet, but there's promise. And I absolutely love doing it. It's a passion. It's a calling. And you know, I need to know how the world works. And so I have the urge to keep reading and, and interviewing smart people. So tell us a bit about you know germ warfare, why you do it, uh, and mm. was it a naturally occurring podcast or did it come out of a Wuhan lab? You know, what is its origin? So um, it came from a bat. No. Um, so look, I will say this quickly. Um, I will definitely um, promote promote um, your podcast on, on my side and um, I'll chat to you. I'll chat to you about that uh, offline. Um, but I, I let me go back a few years. To create to create the backstory and 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 the context, I I am a varsity dropout, so I have no qualifications to my name whatsoever. I and I don't know I don't know how this occurs, but I failed art school. So please, for the love of sanity, tell me who fails art. Anyway, I failed art, um, and uh, I decided after that to become a full time artist, <laughs> uh, as as you do. And I think I think some of that um, attitude, you know, came from my upbringing of I have a personal love for sort of the uh, punk scene, the punk rock scene, going back to the seventies already, um, and and the attitude of uh, of always challenging the establishment and and looking for the counter narrative. And if somebody says, you know, particularly an establishment like a university says you're not good enough, uh, then I tend to think, nah, that's probably not true. Um, and as such, I then uh, fumbled and stumbled my way around the sort of corporate world for the next couple of years. And, and then I started drawing cartoons. Uh, and, um, and when I started getting officially published in, in um, newspapers, I, I, I used that, that as my little, my little carrot, you know, carrot in front of the donkey. Um, and that was when I realized that I, I could probably do something with this. And of course, you know, income was a, was a, was a disaster, but I think, and I'm not a motivational speaker at all, but I will say this, that if you genuinely believe, like you truly genuinely believe that you can make something work and you are passionate about it, I think you can make it work, um, no matter what it is. And, and, um, 
one of the sort of stoic ways of thinking is if there's an obstacle, you can turn that into a into a you know a catalyst into into success. You know, never see something as a as a as a form of defeat. And I had many opportunities, and I'm very grateful for them. I started drawing for some of the largest newspapers in in, in South Africa, largest papers, and eventually my work started appearing now and then in newspapers in Europe and the US. Uh, I, I to this day, I don't think my work has ever appeared in Mexico. <laughs> Probably not. But but I think I'll try and change that from now on because I have a suspicion that Mexico is a hell of a uh, a cooler country than the than the media makes it out to be, but having said that, so South Africa, South Africa is a is definitely a poster child of like racism and violence and all those things. Um, and so when you when the media says stuff like that, you can often assume that it's not quite like that. Um, but yeah, and so and so I just drew cartoons and I've been doing it now professionally for for nearly for seventeen years or so. I think. It's hard to know exactly how many I've drawn. Maybe seven thousand published pu- published cartoons, multiple languages around the world in multiple countries. I've won multiple awards, although I no longer partake in award ceremonies, um, and that's by by choice because I don't want to be part of that of that that sort of that circle jerk uh, where they all go and they high five one another and they pat one another on the back and it's it's a cesspit of just uh, I don't know what to call it, but it's it's not. It's not real, um, and I've also I also stopped. I've published two books, and I stopped publishing the books because my my royalty cut was terrible. I mean, I published with like Penguin Books, which is one of the largest publishers in the world, and I think they gave me like fourteen percent or something. I mean, that's tragic. Um, so I decided after that that I wouldn't go, uh, or if I would, if I did publish again, then it would be fully independent. Um, and and it's been years now, and I think I might go down that road now, but I might do it fully independently. And then, in a long roundabout way, I apologize. I'm taking a long time to answer your question, but when all this COVID nonsense started, uh, the uh, the 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 fake the fake what would you call it the fake narrative when it all started and uh, our lockdowns began, uh, much like you and everybody else around the world. We couldn't leave the house, and um, so I started creating um, live streams, uh, just with random people, just with friends, because I was bored. Um, and I found myself enjoying it. It was quite a lot of fun because, you know, you're able to chat to people, and then you see the comments, and it there's a little bit of a I don't know what to, I don't know it's like it gives you an adrenaline rush. It's quite it's quite fun, um, and it just kind of grew. Um, I just decided that I was getting bored with chatting to friends. <laughs> And I wanted to chat to more interesting people. And, and so then I chatted to more interesting people. And from that, I chatted to more interesting people. And, and, and yes, where I am now, you know, where I, I, I genuinely believe that I'm uh, fortunate because I chat to some of the most amazing guests in the world. Yeah. Um, and so now, so now my, my career has split into two. I am, I'm still, I'm still a full-time political cartoonist. Um, but now I also generate a substantial portion of my income from, um, from doing my, my podcast. Yeah. You recently, I saw you spoke to Robert Kennedy Jr. Who, uh, I think way back I had tried to get him on, uh, I wasn't successful. So yeah, you talked to a lot of like world-class, uh, people and, uh, just to continue along these lines, I thought for, you know, on occasion, it might be interesting for listeners to hear a bit more about, uh, behind the scenes of, of what it, mm. you know, po- podcasting. And so, for example, you know, talking about guests, uh, I'm constantly sending out guest requests. And so sometimes I'll get no responses. Uh, I'll get guests who say yes, and then just kind of sort of disappear. Uh, and then, of course, I get the people who probably confirm the interviews. And then I, I, I've lately, I've been getting people from out of nowhere who want to be guests. And some of them have absolutely like, no <laughs> background. I'm like, I mean, sorry, I can't, I can't just have random people uh, yes. on and so w- what has been uh, but then then recently I, you know i had I've, I've had some important people on as well who had reached out so w- what it's been your experience like uh with guests in general i don't find myself too unlucky with guest responses um but let me try and qualify that i'm very fo- hyper focused on on my guests so I don't I don't send out like a batch of invitations to various people and kind of wait wait for any of them to reply. Um, if I wanted you on my podcast next week, 
then I'll focus on that for the next day. And that's all I'm focusing on. It's just getting uh, in touch with you and trying to get you to notice my, my communication. Um, it's maybe not the best way of doing things, um, but I'm not very good at multitasking. <laughs> so, um, so I, and also I, I try and customize, you know, my emails. I, I, I don't, I don't really have this like, well, I mean, I kind of have a generic email, but you need to know a little bit about, about the guest. Um, and so, you know, you've got to customize it to, to cater for the guest, but also the guests who I want on, I'm also inviting on because I have a very specific reason for wanting them on. So if I want to talk about bio warfare, uh, then, you know, it's about bio warfare. And so therefore I, I'm, I've, I've, I spend a bit of time researching that guest. So I, I find f- the part for me, that's the hardest actually is finding the contact details <laughs> of the guest. Not, not, not actually getting a response because I've, I've been quite lucky. Oh, I don't know, 70, 80% of the time with my communication. Um, I think if you, if you are very, if you're decent and you're genuine um, and you know something about the guest, they, they do tend to reply. Um, but it's, it's that initial, it's that initial search for their contact details that, that, that I find quite, quite difficult. Um, and uh, the other thing I find quite tricky also is the time zones. This, this, this is one of those, one of those global issues that's, it's, it's going to be, you know, forevermore uh, an issue. So I've got a, I've got a shortcut saved <laughs> where I, I can always check out people's times where they are. Um, so you start learning. I don't know if, if it's the same with you, but um, okay. So where I'm located geographically, I'm sort of in the middle of, of, of earth. So my so, if you, to me you you're behind, and then uh, Australia would be ahead. So I always see myself as in the middle. So I've got to, I've got to try and figure out the time zone. So I always see myself sort of in line with London, more or less, like maybe by one hour. So I, I like to use the London time zone as a, as my marker, um, and then it's you're either behind me or you're ahead of me. So that kind of thing, you know, these these weird little quirks that you that you figure out as you go along. Um, but in terms of the podcasting stuff itself, like I know very little about it. Yeah, and I would say I have the same problem. Like there are some people, uh, listeners bring up to me um, on different social media, hey, interview this person and I check them out and like they don't have a website, they don't have um, yeah. anything. And like I spend, sometimes I'll spend hours trying to find uh, their contact. Sometimes I'll find it, sometimes no. I don't, generally, I don't like to ask people that I know um even some of the guests I've been become kind of friends with, I don't like to bug people about other people's uh, contact information. And so, um, yeah, that's, is there anything then in general about podcasting? Like it's a, is it, what does it entail for you? Like it's, it's a full-time job. No, like what, what, what are some hmm. easy things or, you know, things you get uh, that are enjoyable behind podcasting or what are some like hmm. obstacles, you know, what, what, what does it entail just you know, in general? I, I must, I must say, I enjoy learning. Uh, so, so uh, I I read a lot also. So if I if I am reading multiple books at the same time, and I'm finding it really interesting, then I'll you know I'll want to get hold of that that author, uh, you know, um, and chat about not just that, but you know collateral talking points um and i've i've also found that okay yes 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 something that i've learned from uh, from the podcasting and this has been a very sharp learning curve for me but over the last 12 months i've i've shifted my approach in how i talk to my guests so excuse me um initially I wanted to, you know, have debates and bounce, bounce differing ideas. But then I think I might've mentioned to you earlier, I found that it's difficult to do that if you have only one hour or one and a half hours. Um, and so you got to shift gears a little bit and, and figure out what is, what is it that you want out of this conversation? And that was something that I, that I started realizing very quickly um, is, is, is to try and get that sort of single, that single talking point. 
um, and then focus everything around that. Um, you know, and funnily enough, funnily enough, guests are very receptive to the, the conversational manner. Um, I, I, I always get, always get an email every few weeks of someone saying, stop drinking whiskey in front of your guests. It's disrespectful. It's rude. But I, I don't see it as that, uh, mainly because first it's nighttime for me. Um, and it's my way of relaxing. But secondly, secondly, a relaxed guest is a great guest. And I don't interview. Something that I learned from Joe Rogan is not to interview. I'm not a journalist. I want to have conversations. I want to learn. Uh, you're the expert. You know a lot. So I want to listen to you. Um, and, and if you really don't want me to have my whiskey, I won't have it. But I haven't had a single guest yet who has been adverse to me drinking whiskey. In actual fact, in actual fact, many of them have turned around and said, oh, give me one moment. I'm going to go get myself a, a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And it's funny. I have the exact same approach uh, as you. I just kind of tend to, to have my guests do like a memory dump, a, a data dump. And people are here to hear my experts speak and not me. And I get a lot of comments that say, I love how you, the host, the podcaster, just let the experts speak because there are other podcasts where the hosts are like jumping in and they talk as much as their guests. And it's like, that's annoying. And and I have the same thing when I listen to other podcasts, like I want to listen to the guest. I don't want to listen to mm -hmm. the host. So um, uh, another topic is censorship. So, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on this mm. insane Orwellian censorship that we're all witnessing, experiencing, um, if I'm not mistaken, your Twitter, Facebook, YouTube have been terminated. And, and furthermore, uh, you know, I follow your Telegram channel and your war reports. Uh, other services that you use have also deplatformed you. I think Spotify just took you down yeah. three weeks ago, you said. So tell us about uh, your experience, how you got through it. Uh, and, you know, the bigger picture, your observations of what this all portends for the future. Yeah. So, OK, let me just make one correction. I, I proactively left Twitter. Uh, tw Twitter would you believe it didn't ever censor me um very very strange but i made a decision after facebook facebook censored me they took down my 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 page i had a i had a fan page they killed it i think i had 60000 more or less 60000 um what do you call it fans likes followers i don't know what you call what do you call it right um so after that happened, I decided, well, I don't want to support Jack Dorsey because he's in the same camp, that Silicon Valley sort of woke p thought police camp. So I, I actively shut down my Twitter account. Uh, and it so happened that that's more or less the same time YouTube <laughs> took down my channel. Um, and I thought, ah, you know, it's okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start a channel on Telegram because Telegram so far, for the most part, seemed to be quite resilient to censorship. In actual fact, it's Apple and Google from the App Store that are trying to censor the channels. But then Telegram say, well, okay, it's okay. Then just download you know, the app directly from the website or whatever. So they do seem to be making the right sounds um, for now at least. I wouldn't put all my eggs into the Telegram basket. Um, so I have just recently set up an account with Gab. Um, Gab does seem to be fairly resilient as well. Uh, and I, I like Gab. I've got no issues with Gab. It's phenomenally massive now. Um, but Gab and Telegram are still very much centered around servers, centralized servers. And one of the things that I did after leaving YouTube was move to Odyssey, um, which is blockchain-based, decentralized, almost impossible to censor. Telegram and Gab are not that. And so I am still eagerly awaiting for a good, really sexy platform that can, that can compete with them. I know that there are others like Mines and... I don't know. I'm trying to think. I can't think of offhand um, blockchain 
alternatives. But mines didn't really appeal to me. I, I there was too much of a focus on uh, tokens and things, and I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not geared that way. I just wanted to be a bit simpler. You know, uh, Gab Gab is still fairly simple. Telegram is the simplest for me. You know, and and so so yeah. So I kind of kind of moved there, and then. And I think you'll you'll probably be be keen to hear about this. So I decided to try and and sort of bulletproof my my internet presence a bit. Um, and this is now what I think is where we should be going if we're going to try and remain independent. We've got to try and make ourselves bulletproof. Uh, bulletproof doesn't mean having five hundred social media accounts. I actually think that's counter. I think that's counterproductive. My personal view, um, because gee, man, I mean. Dude, I can only I, I can only focus on one woman in my life now, I can, and similarly I can only focus on one social media account. <laughs> so I think having fifteen social media accounts is just too many. So I I'm trying to find that sweet spot, that sweet spot of having as few internet presences as possible, but the most bulletproof. If that makes sense. So like Odyssey, as videos go, I think is very bulletproof. Uh, in terms of audio podcasting, as you correctly said, Spotify banned me. So I have a suspicion that Apple and Google are going to go down that road soon also with, with um, censoring podcasts. But I think, as I mentioned to you earlier, there is, there is going to be a blockchain decentralized audio podcasting presence coming out soon. They are all in development. They're just not very good. Um, but they're there. And, and, that, and that's something we need to keep our eyes on. In terms of our websites, we need to try and get them onto independent services where possible. Dedicated hosting, it's expensive, but I'm I'm again certain that these options are are are, are becoming more and more accessible now that big tech is censoring like there's no tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think that pretty much covers the internet internet territory. Um, but basically, basically, yes, my point. Censorship is happening, and we can make a decision to become a loser and a total pathetic defeatist and go, oh, oh, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm just being censored, left, right, and center. Or we can see it as an opportunity to find a more resilient, more bulletproof angle. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And just one more final question on podcasting before we move on mm -hmm. to some of the issues uh, of the day was... <coughs> you know, slander and, and, and hit pieces, you know, before I started post podcasting, well, even when I was teaching, I was teaching all like counter narratives and being a dissident. So in the classroom, in the education field, I was uh, suffering um, some persecution. But, you know, on, on German warfare, you cover uh, a lot of topics. Uh, I do the same here on geopolitics and empire. You've been looking at the crown virus and great resets, 9-11, 5G, South Africa, China, wokeism, gun rights, the moon landing, the Holocaust industry, flat earth, uh, and so on. And obviously you don't agree with all uh, your guests yeah. have to say is neither do I like on the flat earth. I mean, you know, come on. And, but we need to dialogue uh, and, and it's fun. And yet some listeners, government agents and journalists, right? insane hit pieces uh, and lie about us. Uh, I've had Apple reviews call me anti-Semite. Okay, you know, I grew up in, in a Jewish town uh, in Skokie, Illinois. Um, I've been to Israel and I support Israel as a state. So there's no evidence for that lie. I've been called a Russian agent. Uh, I'm a Slav, but I don't particularly care for the Russian government more than any other. Um, you know, for example, I've been called a Marxist uh, on Apple reviews, mm. even, even though, and people left a one-star review, oh, he's a communist Marxist, because I spoke to some left-wingers, and you know, I'm anti-Marxist and I'm <laughs> anti-communist. So I've been called a crazy libertarian as if that's a bad thing, uh, even though I wouldn't call myself a libertarian. And you know, yeah. Apple, uh, Apple, Apple reviews also says that, you know, I give platform to racists and nationalists, which again is just stupid. So, you know, I, I, I honestly think that most of these slurs are actually from the establishment and maybe a few from the liberal uh, woke crowd. Uh, I mean, because, you know, I've been mentioned by the Associated Press in a piece co-written by NATO on conspiracy, conspiracy super spreaders. So we know, you know, the UK has something called the 77th Brigade, where they send soldiers uh, online. And this is their job to, to, to slander people who are telling uh, the truth. And so they want to make you look like a crazy person 
Uh, so, mm. so they can then discredit you. Uh, you know, what has been your experience with hit pieces uh, and slander and how do you deal with it? I personally have a thick skin, so I really don't care what anyone says about me because I know what's true and what's not. So, you know, what, what's your take there? Um, it's a journey. I think is, is my answer. It's a journey. Um, I, I have, I mean, this year I've had a number of mainstream media pieces in South African media uh, published about me. Um, obviously, hit pieces trying to take me on or take me down or whatever a couple a couple ways of doing this ignore uh which is probably the best uh don't don't respond i i i've made the mistake of of responding in the past and it's stupid uh there's no point in me giving my time to them let them have their cesspit you know uh it's okay the problem is this a few years ago when i was beholden to clients and a handful of clients and the clients get get itchy fingers and they go well we don't like what happened there we don't we don't know if our association with you is a good idea now that's where it gets real and that's that's what i that's the part that i do understand with um you know with with many people not wanting to have pieces written about them in the media i am a lot more bulletproof now than i've ever been i have a very I have a very strong independent financial support base. Um, I'm not beholden to any clients, just about. I've got almost no clients. In actual fact, uh, I choose my clients now. You know, they don't, I, I, I will tell them if I want to work with them or not um, when it comes to my cartoon work. Um, and that's, that's a good place to be. But remember, it's also taken me 15, 16 years. Um, so I think, I think I got my stripes, but the point, the point is this, is that you, you've got two choices. When a piece comes out about you, you can either have a, a horrible night's sleep and get heartburn and, and get a few extra gray hairs, or you can laugh it off. And I think that the latter is the more powerful option. Uh, I've made the mistake. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, we have a um, an anti gun rights lobby here in South Africa, and they um, well, I'm sure every I'm sure every country does <laughs> that has guns. Uh, by the way, does Mexico have have gun rights? They do. I've actually looked into obtaining uh, guns legally here. I have a U.S. firearms uh, license, but. Uh, in Mexico, they've made it nearly uh, impossible to have something called Sedena, which is like you have to do an insane amount of uh, paperwork to get your license. And there's only one legal gun shop, which is in Mexico City. And that's the only place you can buy guns. I guess you can buy it from private individuals if they have the, their firearm legally registered. But now I'm hearing that people, uh, th their applications are like taking months even a year yeah. and then once you get your gun license in mexico uh they're saying like to get you have to make an appointment to go to the gun store in mexico city and that's taking months and months and even some people up to a year so it's just like it's they're making it really hard to get guns meanwhile yeah. there's so many illegal guns all over the place it's it's insane so they're doing something similar here um they're trying to make it more difficult to get a gun okay so nevertheless I, I'm obviously in favor of gun rights. I'm in favor of self-defense. In actual fact, I don't understand why it would even be controversial in the slightest. You know, the greatest, the greatest equalizer in gender-based violence is a gun. You know, put a gun in a woman's hand. And I'll tell you right now, any kind of rape situation, uh, uh, any kind of violence against her is going to be minimized very quickly. So I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure why this is a controversial thought at, at all. Nevertheless, uh, the anti so a, a mainstream media outlet contacted me for my commentary because our government here wanted to amend the gun the the gun laws uh, to make it harder. And obviously, I um, am opposed to it, and I've been uh, quite vocal about it. So they decided they wanted to get my opinion on this. Little did I know that they were actually the journalist was actually trying to set me up for something else. Um, but and I made the mistake. I made the mistake, and I will not do this again. I made an error of judgment in which I trusted the journalist. She sounded quite decent on the phone. Make no mistake, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not 
interested in in interviews with the mainstream media. But what happened was, so she started asking me for my views, and it sounded fine. And I said, "Yeah, look, you know, I think everybody needs to be able to defend themselves." And uh, and she kind of went on on a tangent, and she decided to have a go at my Telegram channel, which I know you are familiar with. And it's it's a wild west. That's the truth. My, my Telegram channel is a wild west, and I like it like that. All right, I'm I'm I love it. All right, I I don't want it to be this sort of safe space. I want the crazy people to be there. I want nut nut job ideas thrown around. I love it. And um, th- th- as it turns out, so there were some people who were rather aggressive towards the anti-gun lobby in some of the threads. And uh, this journalist picked up on that and said, "Listen, you, are you you know are you okay with the fact that there are uh, death threats that are being sent to the anti?" The anti-gun lobby, you know, the gun, the anti-gun rights group. I said, no, of course not. I mean, I don't agree with death threats. She says, okay, but it's your responsibility. I said, well, no, not really. I mean, you know, I can't be held responsible for what other people say. She said, okay. She said, but what do you think of the fact that that the anti-gun rights group is the head, the the head of the, group, the anti-gun rights group is receiving death threats? So I said, well, maybe, maybe they need to look at getting guns. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And then, the solution. And she went dead quiet. And I said, it's a joke. <laughs> so I think, anyway, so I, w- I went on a tangent there, but I think the, the moral of the story is you have to make a decision how you're going to respond. And um, my guess is the powerful response or the empowered response would be no response. Don't give them your time. They're looking. They're looking to try and hurt you, to harm you, to trigger you. Don't let it. Just I, ignore I, it and carry on with carry on with what's important. I feel the same as you, and it's it's not like it may have been decades ago where journalists at least had this veneer of being fair and objective, and now yeah. it's just like journalists are the establishment's propagandists. They're out to get you. They have one mm. side uh, of the story, and yeah. it was. Um, I mentioned the piece in February of 2021 that called us COVID conspiracy spreaders that actually that same journalist contacted me in in the summer of 2020. And I just didn't respond because I knew right away Associated Mm. Press. um, And he was asking about me. He's like, I want to know who you are. Well, you know, it's really, really weird. It's like, why do you know who I, who I am? You know, where I come from? What do I do? All this stuff about me. It's like, you're going to make it, who cares about me? You know, I had just do a podcast. I care about the guests. And uh, I, I didn't respond. And sure enough, that piece that he wrote or was going to write, write that came out that had no mention of me was a hit piece about, you know, crazy conspiracy stuff. And I, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. So someone, someone calls me a COVID conspiracy spreader. That's a compliment because uh, I would rather be spreading the conspiracies than, consp- than conspiracy theories. A conspiracy is something that actually happens. And here's a big thing now that, that, that I've been trying to wrap my head around. This term conspiracy theorist has been used more than, I've, than I can remember in my life. Um, and I, I love it. I don't see it as a bad thing um, at all. For me, it's a compliment because the people who say, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist. What does it say about them? Are you, are you, are you such a blinded uh, sheep that you think that there are no bad people in the world? What do you think happened leading up to the Rwandan genocide? Do you think that there was nothing being conspired? Do you think that that it just spontaneously emerged on a particular day? No, it was planned for months, and we know this now. The United Nations even exited Rwanda quite quickly when it started happening. Um, that was a conspiracy. It was a conspiracy by the Hutus against the Tutsis. What do you think happened uh, with Operation Paperclip? Another conspiracy. What do, you, what do you think happened with the tobacco industry when they hid um, cancer evidence for decades? Conspiracies happen, and those are big conspiracies, but small conspiracies happen. Okay, let's talk about another big one, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were conspiracies that took years of planning. And there were people, there were people sitting around a table orchestrating it. 
Um, and on a daily basis, there are conspiracies. Small, uh, 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 people conspire against other people. Human nature is full of conspiracies. And what is a conspiracy theorist? It's somebody going, oh, I don't know. I have a feeling that this, that this Rwandan government is, is going to do something bad to us. No, dude. You're being a conspiracy theorist. The government will do nothing. Why would they want to kill you? I don't know. Something about them calling us cockroaches constantly. You know? Nah. You, you, you know, you're just you're imagining things. All right, fine. Well, a million dead people later. So the idea of a conspiracy theorist is merely just a, it's a, it's a, it's a, what is it? It's, it's an attempt to silence a, a dissenting voice. It's an attempt to silence a critical a, a, a form of critical thinking. And here's the deal. Not everything is a conspiracy theory. That's the beauty of it. You know, um, I don't know if NASA is conspiring against the entire world to hide the fact that Earth is actually flat. You know, who knows? Okay. But for me, it's a bit, it's a, probably a bit out of the realm of reality. Okay. But I'm happy to entertain it. I have, I'm, I'm not about silencing, um, dissenting voices in actual fact in actual fact let me say this i read a uh, i read a study a psychological study a few months ago and I'll, I'll email it to you if you if you haven't seen it they it was it was found that people who trust the science are more likely to believe nonsense than those who don't trust the science and there's something very 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 profound about that because if someone says well it's science it's scientific that Earth is round, right? We must just simply trust it, and that's it. Okay, they're more likely not to question things. Now, I I read another analysis about people who believe Earth is flat. Now, let me just say again, I don't think Earth is flat. All right, and I, it's weird that I've got to say that because we we've we're in a weird kind of zeitgeist where you can't just have a conversation about something before people want to, you know, they want to not pigeonhole you and put you into a box and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, and I, I remember reading this in an article, and I, I wish I could find it. They, they said that people who question not just the shape of the earth, but like, I don't know, how the pyramids got there or whatever, whether there's life, other extraterrestrial life or whatever, people who think like that tend to be on a higher intellectual level. They tend to be on a spectrum that's slightly higher because they're thinking, they're thinking beyond what they're told. If that makes sense. So even if the Earth, even if Earth isn't flat, but there's, but they're seeing things that don't make sense to them. That means they're thinking, they're thinking critically, and that is what we need to be doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of what you said. Like when uh, the people who accept the official narrative, uh, they say, "Oh, the science authorities say this." Okay, I, I leave my brain right here. I won't investigate further. This yeah. is what they say it is. W meanwhile, other people like like us were like. We just keep, I devour books and interviews mm. and documentaries. And I, I mean, I got behind me the, a conspiracy theory book written by uh, Land Professor Emeritus out of Florida, Lance DeHaven Smith, uh, who in his book reveals from declassified documents how the CIA sent a memo in the 1960s to tell the mainstream media to start using the term conspiracy theory basically yes. as a way to discredit uh, because people were not believing the official narrative of the John Kennedy assassination. And so this was their way to discredit anyone telling yeah. the truth. And I interviewed the professor who wrote the book, Lance DeHaven Smith. People can find it in the archive of this podcast. And so, again, we are the people who are actually going to the source, finding the facts, and you get this information. And then people, like, they still call you crazy. But, I mean, anyways, I don't have time anymore. To, I, I can't deal with these people who... Yeah, are, are these lemmings, and it's just like there's a big enough group of us. Actually, I think it's 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 a, a bigger group of people who are conspiracy theorists. That, that I mean, I, I've lived in different countries, and just talking to everyday people, you'll find that most people are actually questioning, and, and they they make yeah. it out that you're the minority when actually you're the majority. And, and you know, it's 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 also interesting. You know, Peter Bogosian from Portland University. Um, I don't know if you know him. Uh, he wrote an amazing, excuse me, he wrote an amazing book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. It's a life-changing book. Um, I've read it twice. Um, and and he he became, a, for a short period in time, he became a bit of a mentor to me. 
uh, I would ask him questions and how do I, sorry, this whiskey is giving me a bit of heartburn now. Um, he was, uh, he was giving me some advice on how to approach certain conversations. Like for example, um, a lot of people might know that, that, that church in the U S called Westboro Baptist church, uh, otherwise known as God hates fags.com. Um, fascinating, fascinating church, very small, and yet incredibly well known. And they make so much money because they win lawsuits on based on free speech. I mean, it's genius. Um, they they get sued all the time and they keep winning. Okay. So they, they make a lot of money from, from winning lawsuits. So they're very clever that way. And I don't know if they really are Christians. Who knows? It doesn't really matter to me. But I still nevertheless find them absolutely fascinating. So I had them on my podcast. Now, I obviously don't agree with them. But they are also, an, no, they're not oppressed. They're a suppressed um, view, you know. And 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 what's interesting is that there was a lot of outrage on social media at that time when they when when I advertised that, that they were coming onto my podcast, and there were these terms like or these phrases like, "Yeah, Germ is providing a platform too," and there's an interesting notion for me, providing a platform too. What does that say? I remember, no, I don't remember, but I've seen footage, I've seen articles of when back in the days of yore, uh, when journalists or investigators or people making documentaries actually wanted to learn about different kinds of people. It wasn't about giving a platform to, it was just learning. Now there's this idea that you have to silence people or not give them a platform. Why? That seems very cult-like to me. Um, if their views are so ridiculous, then I'm pretty convinced that my audience will also find those views ridiculous and not take them seriously. Um, if it is the case that some people in my audience agree with Westboro Baptist Church, then so be it. Where's the crime here? You know, Why is it such a bad thing to listen to the views of extremely bizarre people so what i would love to because and again yes what peter bogosian said remember that other people think that they that they are correct in their views you know you and i might differ on some things and the reason for that is because we think that we are correct on those things and so we we adopt a position that we think is more correct and so we'll have a conversation to try and persuade the other person to change their view that's how that's how it works we don't we don't by default adopt a position that we think is wrong that that makes no sense okay so if somebody is a former leader of the kkk for me that's fascinating i would love to know love to know what 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 his childhood was like how did he get to that place where he wanted to be in the kkk you know for me that's fascinating it doesn't mean i agree with him but but people like him exist and you, you, you cannot pretend that they don't exist. Yeah, and speaking about giving a platform, so we can go back in history, how many mainstream you know, media sources have given platform to, you know, in the 1930s, Time Magazine called Hitler Man of the Year, I think Stalin as well. So it's like, okay, you're giving platform to, I mean, it's just total hypocrisy. Uh, and it yeah. shouldn't be like this. This is how history, life has always been since the beginning of time. You, you talk to people and you, you don't agree w w with them. You mentioned at the beginning um, of this of this conversation. You mentioned some of the some of the topics that I've done in uh, the Holocaust industry. Now, there's one that that's probably one of the most dangerous that you could ever ever um, do. But yes, the thing. I did two podcasts, I think, on the Holocaust industry, and uh, and the reason for that is because leading up to it, when I was, I, I think I had read something by Norman Finkelstein, who happened to be one of my guests. Uh, by the way, for those who don't know who he is, he's, he's a Jew who lost most of his family on his father's side and his mother's side in Germany, in, in the, the Nazi Holocaust. Okay, He himself has spoken out against the what he calls the Holocaust industry, um, and he was banned from entering Israel for 10 years. Okay, Now, what led me to getting him onto my podcast was why? Why is this so taboo? And and the moment the moment people start saying don't do it, don't do it, 
that's the worst thing you can possibly do because then I'm thinking, ah, why? Why, why, is this a, why is this such a, a taboo topic? If I wanted to talk about whether or not Jesus really existed, am I going to get the same backlash? I might get some backlash. Now, I am not an atheist, but I can still have that conversation, even, even if it's taboo, even if it's harsh. I, what about having a conversation about you know, depictions of Muhammad? what is it about certain conversations you know you're not allowed to have and the moment the moment someone says to you you may not talk about that there's something very wrong yeah 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 it's and and i agree with you it's like i have a bunch of people especially in the telegram channel now i don't know if they're genuine or not i think there are some that are not genuine and that it's an it's, it's an entrapment where they constantly post pro Nazi, pro Hitler. Yeah, uh, I have the same problem. And, and anti Semitic material. And I'm not talking about questions as, as you're talking about. Like Norman Finkelstein, he used to teach uh, in Illinois, where I'm from, I think from DePaul, 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 DePaul University. Um, and uh, he said, obviously, the, the Holocaust happened. He's not denying it. I'm not denying it. It happened. But then there are some other questions of, of the, uh, he, he calls it this, this industry. And yes. These people in my Telegram channel come and they post, uh, they post these little what do you call them? Gifts or animations uh, uh, that are of of you know Jewish people depicting them. It, it's it's a, you know they have these little comics that depict them as like evil and the hatred. And I'm like that is racist. You're ha you're hating an entire ethnicity. You know I I delete that that stuff. I mean it's like that's crazy. And so. Anyways, you know, that's that's what's what's going on. And it's okay I think, to hate some people. I mean, let's be honest. Nobody likes Mexicans. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, there, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the issue is on people's character and actions, right? You can't <laughs> j just hating any ethnic uh, group or, or or race or, you know, whatever. That's that's crazy. So anyways, I think that the, the, they're, they're always trying to get us one way or another. Um, yeah. Um, those sorts of people, I, I also, I mean, I encounter those people daily. Um I'm not entirely certain how to treat those. I just ignore them. Um, I don't think it's worth. I don't think it's worth getting your panties in a knot. I think those sorts of people you can just either ignore, um, or and, and if they really, if they really, really ruin the sort of conversational tone, uh, install some sort of bot that removes those gifts and things, which I've done. Um, but I think for the most part, I think people. And I've noticed this. You would think you would think that we're living in the 17th century, the way people get so offended by things. Who's that comedian? That Australian comedian, Steve Hughes. He did that wonderful, that wonderful little comedy sketch. Uh, you must see if you can find it on YouTube, or uh, or rather, no, we don't like YouTube. Uh, see if you can find it on <laughs> BitChute or Odyssey or something. But he said, he said, everybody gets offended. So what? Nothing happens if you're offended. You don't get leprosy, you know. Um, and and I think that's that 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 that, just, that stuck with me, you know. Like, okay, so you so you, I don't know, you making black people look like gangsters, or you making Jews look like I don't know criminals with their big noses. I mean, we all know, we all we've all seen those things, right? And there's a couple of ways that you can respond to them. You can either go grey, you know, and get frustrated and get a hernia. Or you can just I don't know, send, uh, remove some of it if it's if it's um, messing up the flow of the conversation and just carry on with life. Don't don't make a big deal about it. Yeah, and uh, I guess um, since we're running uh, shorter on time, um, just you know, last question I had topic was you know what's most pressing uh, on your mind these days, judging by, by the themes that you've been covering um, over the last uh, year. Um, I would guess that all of the interviews you've been having is about the crown virus, you know, great reset. And that's kind of what's worrying me uh, at the moment, yeah. because they're trying to install this vaccine passport, social credit, digital ID system. Uh, Ice Age Farmer, who I've interviewed, just posted a video today where he gave an interesting insight. I think he took a flight and he's saying like in the near future, I think this is what's going to happen. They're going to remove the human elements like, you know, border control, uh, flight attendants will be replaced by like he was saying that they, they, they had like cameras in the back of the seat where it notifies 
uh, if, if you took off your mask or something. So the, you, re you remove the human elements and it's just nothing but you, you, nothing between you and the technocratic system and there's no more recourse. And for me, this is like the number one thing that I'm worried about at the moment. Yeah. Uh, what about you? So that's also the number one thing that I'm worried about. Uh, what you're saying is basically we're going to become QR codes. Um, yeah. So that has been... I mean, you know, in a weird kind of horseshoe, that was kind of what started my entire podcast was all of this nonsense. Um, all these other conversations, Holocaust, Flat Earth, all of those are just sort of uh, by conversations to have along the way. But the, the, the overarching theme of my podcast, and probably will be for the foreseeable future, is COVID. But when I say COVID now, I don't mean necessarily the the disease i think i mean i mean everything that's that's that falls into that um the vaccine passport which is the precursor to the digital id which is the precursor to mass surveillance and and dare i say transhumanism um the 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 sort of technocratic wet dream of 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 removing parts of our biology and replace and replace them with robotics so that we can live forever so that we can replace our kidney with something that will never you know re require um replacement or uh become completely immune to every disease out there yes yes the joke though i have a suspicion that all of it's going to backfire because a you cannot become immune to every disease unless you are literally a robot um and secondly and this is where it gets this is where it gets very meta um if if you don't mind me just rambling just a little bit about this because this is this is something that i think about a lot it's not just the digital id and vaccine passport it's it's something bigger um, and I don't know what that is. Catherine Orson Fitz um, says that there's a very spiritual element here. Uh, a number of my guests have said that. And I think they're right. I mean, I'm not a particularly religious person. But my goodness me, it's difficult to rule that out. Uh, when, when, I say, when I say spiritual or religious, I don't necessarily mean um, in what perhaps we were taught in Sunday school growing up. Uh, there's definitely a good and evil um, meta meta fight, meta battle going on. I like to see Lord of the Rings as the as the sort of the analogy with Frodo as a representation of what's good, trying to get to you know uh, the end, and everything that else is happening around the world is basically the fight to make sure that he gets to the end. You know, without all those collateral battles that happen, he he, he wouldn't have been able to make it. Um, and something else that I see that, that I do think about is I, I don't, so I'm, I'm stumbling on my words because I'm trying to think, I'm trying to, th trying to think how to say this. I don't think, I don't think there's a small group of people who are sitting around a table orchestrating the entire direction of the world. That's, I don't think that. I do think that there are many groups of people sitting around tables orchestrating the direction of the world, if that makes sense. So be it Google, be it Apple, be it um, BlackRock, the Vanguard Group, um, the, 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 the Rockefeller Foundation who are constantly putting out um, ideas of, what, of where they see the world going. The World Economic Forum, I think, is a great evil. But yes, what's funny. These are all rich and powerful organizations, and they all know one another, and they all meet up at Davos and various things. This isn't this isn't some weird kind of sci-fi scenario that I'm creating. This, these are real people who are extremely rich, extremely powerful, Gates Foundation, etc., and they know one another. They talk to one another, and most likely are in the same Telegram groups, many of them, or WhatsApp or whatever whatever form of communication they use, and they definitely meet up. On an annual basis, we know that they meet up at Davos, for example, where they where they talk about things on a global level. I think central bankers play a massive role in the direction of the world. Um, if 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 central bankers meet 
meet with the IMF, etc. And they say, you know what? We've got some serious problems here with, with the US dollar. We, there's too much, there's too much inflation. There's too much. We cannot get the debt down. What do we do? We need to reset everything. We need to default everything. And how do we do that? Oh, I don't know. Imagine, imagine if there were a pandemic, like if there was some sort of virus that could spread the world. And even if it's not real, nobody will know because it's invisible. And all we're going to do is we've got to get we've got to get old Tedros to send out an email to his 184 member states. I mean, I I send out more emails than that. And he has to send out 184, 190, whatever it is. Say, so guys, we believe that there has been a, a pathogenic leak from a laboratory in China. We need we recommend all countries take precautionary measures. There we go. How easy is that? I mean, it's not exactly. It doesn't require massive planning. And this is the kind of stuff that I'm thinking about. Um, this is major, major like black pool stuff because you can't stop it. So, 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 and I'm rambling, please interrupt me. But there's, there's an alternative thought process that's happening here, or not an alternative, a parallel thought process. So on the one hand, you've got this massive, you've got this massive global shift that's happening, right? And it's there's no doubt that it's happening. And anybody who thinks that 190 countries all following precisely the same lockdown, mask, mandate, measures, everything is just pure coincidence, I think you're a lunatic, okay? Absolutely lunatic. It's never happened in history, never. Other than perhaps in World War II, when some countries followed the same sort of things. Um, now, the parallel idea that I think about all the time is how to adapt to that. And that's where it gets really interesting. Um, and, and there's something beautiful about that. Yes, you and I are talking. If there were no fake pandemic or whatever, you and I wouldn't be talking right now. And you and I most likely will continue talking beyond this Zoom call. We're on, we're on different sides of the planet. Okay. But now we've made, it, we've made a network and we've made a link. And from that life can only get better because now we all stay in touch and probably become some sort of virtual friends. And this has happened now all over the world. You so you're finding all these people around the world creating the spider web that perhaps otherwise wasn't there, but not just that. And this is why I said, you, you need to interrupt me if I'm, if I'm going too long because it's, it's quite, it's quite layered, but you've got, then you've got people who are rethinking what they, what they thought they knew about say, I don't know, illness and health. And going, I don't know. I don't know if I trust Pfizer anymore. I don't want to pull for everything. I think I'm going to try and eat healthy. I'm going to get back into the gym because something is wrong here. I don't need to wear a mask. I'm healthy. You suddenly got people all over the world realizing that health is more than just a pull. Um, and then you've got people realizing that, that, that they can go to their local butcher. They can go to the local farmer. They don't have to go to the mainstream franchise anymore because they want to support the small guys who don't necessarily want to mandate masks and vaccines on their staff. So what's happening is that on the one side, you've got this big, this big shift in direction that's happening. And on, and on a very localized level, you've got people rethinking the basics, the basics, uh, the, the, the elements that make us human. That's a very long answer. I apologize. Yeah, that was kind of my final question about, you know, how, how do you adapt? What do we do? And it's kind of like mm. what you were mentioning earlier with the internet as well, like bulletproofing. We need to bulletproof um, everything. And that means becoming decentralized, forming networks, growing mm. your own food, living like on a farm. I can't tell you how many people uh, I know, even some guests that I've spoken to that, like everyone just like get out of the cities, get your own uh, yeah. land. And I, I, I noticed that there tend to be kind of two uh answers uh like what you just described um where you said that there is this parallel economy system forming decentralized um uh, but i'm kind of because i'm a christian and i believe in the bible and i kind of have this more pessimistic view where i think things are inevitable where it says you know in in revelation where it's just going to become progressively worse until it becomes to a point where it's been the worst ever uh, in human history, uh, you know, we're going to get to some kind of point where there's going to be like this, it's going to be a horrible time on earth that it's, it's never been like that. And it never will be after, but, 
and you know Catherine Austin Fitz. I think she says she's a Christian as well. I, and mm. um, and I kind of have... like to call myself a Christian too. I uh, I feel like I need to be in that space. But sorry, carry on. No, I was just gonna say I have this view where it's gonna get dark, uh, and there's no way out, and it's gonna be absolute. Basically, we're gonna be like put in algorithm ghettos, or who knows, even like physically killed or whatever at some point. Maybe not in my lifetime. Maybe in you know my kids or whatever. But I just feel this progression where. It's just going to get so bad and, and that's it. And in the meantime, you try to uh, adapt and do things to minimize the effect of that uh, until it gets like so bad you can't do anything. And so I'm with you that we need to keep fighting and resisting. But at the same time, I feel like it's just inevitable, you know, this doom well, that's coming. That would be then that would be the real black pull. And I think and I think that is the kind of black pull that nobody really wants to hear. It's it's probably true what you're saying, but that's a very very dark kind of kind of response because nobody wants to have a helpless scenario. The truth is that that um, that we as humans can adapt and we do adapt. And if if the system is pressing down on us to the point that we need to readjust, I think that we we will. And let me just say, you you made a you made a little comment there where you said move out into the countryside. Well, the World Economic Forum wants precisely the opposite. They want everybody to move out of the countryside and into the um, sort of metropolises, into the cities. So moving out to the countryside is probably exactly what we should be thinking about doing. We should be getting away from the cities um, and and doing exactly what the sort of globalists want us to do. Um, as hard as it might be, you're right. They might clamp down on 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 that kind of thing, but if you can, you should, and you should definitely. I mean, my wife grows lots of vegetables, you know, and uh, we try and support the local butchers and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I mean, I go hunting every year, and I, I try and you know, I, I try and bring back uh, grass-fed, free-range food um, because it's the healthiest. I think, and, and I think these are all the sorts of things that people can possibly consider doing, and if they can, at least you know, a try. Because if you don't mind me, if you don't mind me just pushing back a little bit on what you're saying, but I don't think it's good for our mental well-being to sit back and go, "Well, okay, nothing can stop it. We must just now wait." Surely, surely, surely that's not the right response. Well, no, I, I would just add again from the Christian perspective, it's not like I'm depressed. I'm happy because the solution is, from the biblical perspective, is Jesus, right? If you're right with Jesus, um, regardless of what happens, you know, then it you, you'll be there. That's the good news. So it's not yeah. like I'm this doomsday uh, prepper or something. It's just like this is going to happen. Okay. I've come to terms with it, but I'm going to be happy in the end because, you know, I, I believe in Jesus and you have. Um, that's it. It's a very, very good point, that. Um, and I, I certainly want to maybe explore that a bit more on my own podcast. Um, I think that's an incredibly interesting angle as well to add. And I think it's an angle that needs to be looked at because, as I said a moment ago, there is something spiritual happening in this entire thing. And I haven't been able to pin it. And I think maybe what you're saying there is part of exactly what it is that I'm trying to, trying to uh, 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 pin. Yeah, so, I, I would just add as well that I could be wrong with my vision of mm -hmm. what's going to happen because, you know, I could be wrong and, you know, maybe I'll change my mind over time because even other Christians have different perspectives of how things might uh, play out. And it's surprising the number of people, even some of my guests that I've been speaking to who after the interview will say, oh, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm also Christian, by the way. It seems like that all of this, what you're describing, this battle between good and evil, it's really making people think about yes. like the meaning of life and everything that they if everything was uh, comfortable we all ha had a nice cars nice job starbucks mcdonald's we wouldn't think about it but it's this discomfort this life and death moment that really makes you think yeah. and i think you're quite right and i i want to say this um i i'm definitely a christian apologist i mean i mean i had I, i've read a, i've read a number of um of sort of christian apologist books in recent times and I, I almost want to say that what's going on in the world right now is also, I might be wrong in this, but what's going on in the world right now seems to be one massive attack also on Christianity. 
um, on on everything that I learned in Sunday school, this seems to be, for example, an attack on. And I, I feel that I feel that I need to take a stand and defend that and protect and protect what what it is that has made uh I suppose, do I say Christianity? I don't know. I don't know if that's the right term, but for what it's worth, I think I think it needs to be fought for. I think it needs to be defended and I think it needs to be protected. Um, I think it's probably the most important, the most important belief system in the world right now. And then I think it goes back to what you're saying. When someone is, well, not always, but usually when someone's being uh, attacked or censored, then they're probably right. They have the truth. Yes. So, you know, it's like you're saying, why are then, why is Christianity being attacked? Uh, but in, in any case, um, final thought for us, any final thought to leave us with? Um, final thought. There's a couple of ways to go about doing this. Um, I would like to, to say that um, whiskey is a phenomenal drink. Um, it's, and, and when it comes to health, it's one of the better alcohols that you can drink. Cause it's for, if you, if you drink a, a good whiskey, it's very low in sugar. <laughs> I would also like to say that since, since you're in Mexico, I am a fan of tequila. Um, and I absolutely love Mexican food. I love Mexican food. The problem is, is that most people I know don't like it because it's, it's quite burny. And when I say Mexican food, I'm obviously referring to the very stereotypical Mexican food that you get, uh, you know, in Western countries. Um, in, in I, I don't know what it's like in Mexico. You probably just call it food. <laughs> Taco, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I'm, I, I absolutely uh, love, I, I actually love a lot of things Mexican. I mean, I grew up with with the Looney Tunes and Warner Brothers cartoons, and I remember that that little mouse who was so fast. What is his name? Um, Speedy, Speedy Gonzalez. That's him. Yep. Uh, I mean, I remember that. I remember those 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 days when when you could do politically incorrect TV cartoons. Every today, if they did that, everybody would get offended, and the thought police would be outraged, and any, whatever. Um, final thoughts. Um, Sure, there are a lot. I think I think what I want to say is this that every sword has got two two edges. All right. So a lot of stuff that's happening in the world right now, we can all relate to. Okay. It's it's the most incredible thing. Everybody's got the same story, from mask mandates to social distancing to vaccines to whatever. Okay. That's the one side of the sword. The other side of the sword is that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a silver lining. There's always something good that can happen, whether it's making new friends, whether it's whether it's becoming a better person on a day-to-day basis, whether it's becoming a healthier person, whether it's, I don't know, whether it's restoring one's faith that one perhaps might have lost. I've 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 had a I've had a roller coaster journey with with faith. All right. Um, I'm certainly not. I'm certainly not an atheist, but I've, I've I've had a roller coaster. But this whole last eighteen months has certainly challenged me again to re, you know, to kind of refine my faith. No doubt, no doubt whatsoever. Um, it's another 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 beautiful aspect of this whole thing is I've realised the importance of family because when when the lockdown started and said you may not see your family, that was when I suddenly realised how how really important it is to see our family and 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 how things don't matter nearly as much you know um talking talking to you now is so much more valuable than me going for a drink at the at the bar because you know i've 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 learned something i've really enjoyed chatting to you and and long may it continue but there's value in that that otherwise might not have happened and I'm realizing that there's that there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of value just in people, in people more than things, and that's only come about because of this last eighteen months. And it, I, and I know that whoever's listening will understand what I'm saying. Um, so it's a very philosophical kind of thought, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. And I will say one thing, one thing extra. I've also learned that you don't need a pull to to increase your mental well-being. 
Yeah, that, that that's true. And your comment about the bar, I mean, you have your own bar in your home, so that's kind of cheating. But and then I was going to say, also, I, I prefer Mezcal. Mezcal, they say, is the, the cleanest uh, hard liquor, which is comes out of here, uh, out of Mexico. Um, and I would say also, you're, you're, it's a similar theme. Your final thought, there are many of my guests who give the same final thought about a silver lining, um, light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, there, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel that comes first, which is the freight train coming your way. But after that, <laughs> but after, after, after that, there is really, uh, you know, a light of the tunnel. And, and as you say, it's made, it made us all think uh, and change ourselves for the better. And, I, and we may not have different visions of the light at, at the end of the tunnel, but I think we, we both agree that, you know, whatever comes, um, you know, good will win uh, in the end. And yes. so you're not, uh, as you said, you're not on Twitter, you're, you're not on Facebook or, or your YouTube, uh, but there is germwarfare.com, Odyssey uh, and Telegram. Uh, are those the best places to find you or is there any yeah, other? Yeah, so the, the easiest, I said earlier that I, I don't like too many things. So the easiest is to go to germwarfare.com and there you'll find your way around to everything else. That's the easiest all but right. Germ Warfare with a J, remember. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll include all the links. So everyone be sure to bookmark at germwarfare.com. Sign up for the War Report uh, newsletter and join his hilarious tel Telegram channel, which I often share on my Telegram. And thanks for being on Geopolitics and Empire. It's a great pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast interview. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list through which you can receive an update of every new podcast, as well as a long list of key news headlines once a week. We're being heavily censored. YouTube has deleted some of our videos, and we currently have one strike. Patreon has terminated our account. Facebook has restricted our page, and Reddit has been the leading posts. Our favorite social media channels are Telegram and Twitter. The best places to watch the podcast beyond YouTube are on Odyssey, BitChute, and Brighteon. The best places to listen to the podcast are on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, Google, or on any other podcast app. To help keep this podcast alive, leave a review on Apple Podcasts and wherever else, subscribe to all our platforms, and leave a donation if possible via Subscribestar, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Ethereum. You can also find us on MeWe, Minds, Gab, Float, VK, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks for listening.